okay so we are going to continue where we left off yesterday which is basically looking at how to interface a peripheral accelerator that you have created to a processing system okay so the overall structure that we are looking at is something like this we have a cpu a bus there is some communication between the cpu and the bus and on the other side of the bus we have memory and we also have in our case one hardware accelerator right the fft module that we are going to look at so like i said earlier the way to visualize this is to say that that bus essentially takes care of mapping all the peripherals including the memory into the address space of the cpu right so for example this corresponds to the physical memory some range of addresses right i don't really care what those numbers are and similarly i have another range of numbers assigned to in my case i have only one peripheral but in general i could assign it to uh, in as many peripherals as i have i could assign a separate address space to each of them okay uh, in fact what we will see is that the particular design that we are looking at has two peripherals so you'll also see what happens when two of them are assigned over there now what is finally required is how do i communicate from the cpu to the peripheral how do i send instructions and data to it and how does the peripheral respond how do i get the data back from the peripheral that's ultimately all that we are concerned with if i am able to create that kind of an interface what it means is that if i can create a piece of hardware that is able to perform a computation faster than the equivalent software then it makes sense for me to create a hardware accelerator like this connect it onto the bus send the data there for computation get the data results back and proceed okay and in general that's what socs do a system on chip is fundamentally that the whole idea of a system on chip is that you have a processor along with a number of peripherals each one of which is specialized at some task okay so like i said earlier the specific bus that we are considering over here is called the axi bus this i think stands for the amba or arm um, one of those extensible interface amba itself stands for some arm um, i'm not sure what but ultimately the point is that it was designed by the company arm um, right and was essentially designed for compatibility with their cpus but given the popularity of the arm processor this is one of the most popular bus standards that exists right now okay why are we interested in a bus standard we would be interested only in the context where we are actually trying to build socs systems on chip right because we want to be able to create a peripheral of our own and attach it to some processor core so intel for example has their own buses right i mean they have a bus that takes care of communication between their cpu memory and whatever peripherals you would find on a laptop or a pc or a desktop right amd pretty much follows the same bus standard so that you can communicate with the same kind of peripherals but in the case of arm given the nature of the company the fact that they don't actually build and sell their own chips they license their cores it made sense for them to actually make their bus standard open right and the whole idea is simply this when i am designing something of this sort the designer of the cpu should not have to worry about what kind of peripherals are going to be connected and similarly the designer of the hardware accelerator or the peripheral should not really need to worry about who built the cpu okay so you want to have this kind of separation right that level of abstraction that allows you to have people independently designing separate parts of the system anybody could design a cpu as long as it is compatible with the axi bus and it would be able to communicate with the processors that we uh, with the hardware accelerators that we are designing similarly anyone can design their own hardware accelerator and as long as the processor core is axi compatible it will be able to talk to that hardware accelerator okay 
So, how does this talking that I'm going on about actually work? What happens is the bus itself consists of a few signals. There is the address, which is typically 32 or 64 bits. In our case, we are looking at a 32 bit system. There is a data bus which is again either 32 or 64 bits and in our case once again the one that we are considering uses a 32 bit data bus. There is a read enable or a write enable and a chip enable which basically also serves as a read enable simultaneously. right? So these are essentially so called control signals. Right, which just take care of whether or not the CPU wants a particular part of the bus to respond. Okay, So like I said earlier, the CPU by itself does not know what kind of peripherals are connected. Ultimately, it has to know because it, you know, the programmer needs to know what peripherals are connected so that you can talk to them. But the CPU by itself should not really care about what you connect. Whatever you connect, as long as it obeys the standard, I should be able to talk to it. Right? I only need some basic information which in this case would correspond to what is the starting or base address and this would essentially correspond to a so called high address. Right? These two pieces of information are required for the CPU. In addition to that it also needs to know something about which address essentially causes what kind of behavior. Okay? What I mean by that is, I can write 1 to let us say the base address, start the accelerator. Right? So this is just a convention that I am choosing. This is not a standard. This is not part of the bus standard. This is not specified by anybody. But this is a convention that I could choose. right? It is up to you. This is entirely left to you because at the end of the day, you as the programmer get to write the device drivers that will ultimately actually make the accelerator do what it is supposed to do. So this is an example. I could choose to make it behave such that if I write one to the base address, it will cause that accelerator to start working. It would be as good as giving a 1 to the start signal on the accelerator. Right? Read a value from base address. <coughs> this could convey some kind of status flags. Right? Why base address? It could be any address within the range of the peripheral. Okay? So these are all conventions which basically define the behavior. So as far as the CPU is concerned, all that it needs to know is within that address range that has been assigned to that peripheral, if I try writing a 1 to the base address or to some other address, it will cause the peripheral to start. If I try reading from some particular memory location, it will give me back a status value. If I try reading from some other memory location, it will probably give me some content of a memory that is stored inside the peripheral. If I try writing, it will assign a value into that memory block. Okay? Those are all standard conventions. They are not part of the bus standard. They entirely change from one peripheral to another. What is the role of the bus in all of this? It has to decode the address and control signals. Okay? So as an example, Let us say base address is equal to 0x 4000,000. I am just going to call this 4000,000, right? And let us say that the high address is 0x 4000 FFFF. This corresponds to an address range of 2 power 16 equal to 64k 
locations or memory addresses okay what does the decoder need to do check whether the address from cpu falls in this range right as long as my choice of addresses starting addresses and address ranges is sensible what i mean by sensible is they are aligned with some powers of 2 this checking is very easy to do it's just a question of masking off some bits and checking whether the result actually you know matches the base so in other words if i take the address and it with the value FFFF0000, any address that is in this range will always give 0x4000, 1000. In other words, it will give you the base address. Right? So, just this operation will tell me that the target that the CPU is trying to talk to is this particular peripheral because the address that it has generated on the bus is in the range of this peripheral's address space. Okay? Once it has decoded it and realized that yes, the CPU wants to talk to this peripheral, the bus can now extract a part of the address. Example, the bottom 10 bits, let's say. And forward to the peripheral. Okay, why 10 bits and why not all the 16 bits? That's your choice. You, in fact, what the address bus itself will do is send all the 16 bits. But the decoder might choose to ignore some of those bits and accept only 10 of those or 12 of those. In fact, we'll see that's exactly what's going to happen. Okay, so this is what the decoder does. The peripheral accept extra address bits not exactly extra, the address bits from the bus and control signals and respond. Okay. So, the best way to understand how this can be done is to look at code, at least in my opinion. Okay. So, what I am going to do is show you what the equivalent code for this would look like. It is very log code. It is not easy to understand, but you can get the gist of it. One thing you will definitely need to do is go back after class, take a look at the code that is generated when you actually synthesize something like this and go through it. Okay. Now this is not absolutely necessary. It is possible to do design without understanding this part of it, but I strongly recommend that all of you go through this process so that you actually know what is going on when a processor is trying to talk to a peripheral. It will help you immensely with any debugging that you need to do. Okay, so let us look at what is involved from the point of view of code itself, right? So what I am going to do is I am looking at the FFT module that I showed yesterday. The only change that I have made is I am considering float and not AP fixed. The reason for that is in order to give the demo, I am going to be running it on a Linux system. I have not yet compiled that using the AP fixed libraries, okay? I I'm just using float over there. Therefore, I just kept it to float in order to show you what the peripheral would do when you use float itself in order to do the computation. The interesting thing is you will find that even with float, you can actually get an acceleration, right? So it does make sense to use a hardware accelerator, even if you actually want to do floating point computations without any loss of accuracy, right? Of course, what's the catch when you use floating point computations? One is the latency and interval. I have not done the data flow optimization over here. I have just done some basic pipelining and so on. It takes around 300 cycles, right? If you remember, the equivalent in the case of AP fixed was less than 100 cycles, okay? So float definitely takes more, 
more importantly the resource usage okay you will find that the resources used for getting a certain implementation using floating point computation is typically much larger than the equivalent resources used for the fixed point computation right so the resource usage will be more in float the maximum clock speed that can be achieved is typically lower right and uh, the number of clock cycles that it takes will also typically be higher okay so those are the primary reasons why people look for moving to fixed point in our case we are going to show that even with floating point you can still get a speed up using the hardware accelerator now the only other change that has been made which is not directly visible over here uh, is that in the directives right so this tab out here on the right hand side you will see that for this FFT module there are some directives I have specified which basically say this is the HLS interface okay what comes up is a set of options over here when you right click on the FFT module it allows you to set the interface directive right and the mode the option that we have chosen over here for the mode is s underscore axi light okay so this is a so called light version of the axi bus what do i mean by a light version essentially what i mean is it does not have all the capabilities of the axi bus in particular there are certain things called burst mode operations pipeline operations and so on which the light bus does not support okay but I'm using it here because it's easy to demonstrate in the projects especially you will almost certainly have to figure out how to use the entire AXI bus otherwise you will not really get much speed up okay we'll see why actually when we look at the demo all right so once I've set it to AXI light that's pretty much all there is nothing more to do but I also take the two values data in and data out and specify for both of them also the HLS interface as AXI light. Okay, so in other words, I've done, I've set the AXI light interface property on three things. One is the return value of the function. The second is the input data and the third is the output data. Okay, the result of all of that when I go to the synthesis tab is that when I look at the ports, Right, you will suddenly find that there is an AP clock, AP reset and one interrupt which we are not really using. But everything else has disappeared. There is no return value, there is no data in, there is no data out. All the memory interface signals that we talked about earlier have disappeared and have been replaced with a lot of so called RTL ports with names that start with the term S underscore AXI underscore AXI light S. Right? You can change this name in the properties of uh, whatever you know while defining the axi light uh, interface it basically asks you for an optional name i just left that out so it created a name of its own right now what are all the signals over here you will see that there are something like 14 15 signals out here right the light version of the bus has that many signals okay so you can imagine what the full bus looks like not too much more it's still around it's not that it has too many more signals it's just that the functionality is increased the important part if you look at it is there are you know it's fairly easy to understand there is something called an address valid address ready address not address sorry uh, write valid write ready write address and uh, similarly uh, read ready read address read valid right there is something a as well as without the a okay so all of those signals are present over there one way to think about that is you are essentially going so uh, I mean you know what are all these signals right now we don't need to really worry about them so I'm not going to try and explain what these signals are actually doing one thing that you do need to understand is this S which is there at the prefix for the uh, for all this for this entire bus stands for the word slave so if we are working in a master slave environment the CPU is considered to be the bus master in this case and this particular peripheral is being implemented as a slave what that means is it cannot initiate a transaction on the bus 
okay what is a transaction on the bus basically saying i want to read this memory or i want to talk to this peripheral i want to put this address onto the bus okay a slave is not permitted to directly do that only the master can do that right and in this case we are just keeping things simple we have a single bus master which is the cpu and we have finally what you'll see is we have two slaves attached to it okay but both of those are working in slave mode meaning that they can only respond to whatever the cpu asks for they cannot generate a bus transaction on their own <coughs> you can have multiple masters on the bus right you can have multiple cpus or you can have dma modules or you can have other peripherals that are directly configured as bus masters in which case the bus complexity starts increasing now it's no longer a question of just decoding it has to actually decide which of these masters is allowed to talk at a given point in time okay so that bus arbitration is something that we will get to later right now we don't have to worry about it so like i said yesterday the generated code is available under this verilog tab the fft.v is the top level module if you go and look at it you will realize that essentially it just consists of instantiation of a few different modules right so there is an fft reverse module there are a bunch of modules which look like some ram blocks and so on but the important thing is finally going to be there is one big block that is the axi interface so right now i'm just going to jump straight into that and see if we can understand what that axi interface is doing right one thing you can see over here when it's actually being instantiated this axi interface for my fft module basically says it has an axi address width of 10 right so this is what i meant when i said that the peripheral only accepts 10 of the bits coming from the bus right even though the bus might the bus first of all receives 32 bits from the cpu out of that it decodes the first 16 and it has another 16 available to it it will forward all 16 to the peripheral but the peripheral is only looking at the bottom 10 okay so in other words the peripheral has decided that it only requires an address space of 10 bits the data bus on the other hand is 32 bits as usual okay the signals are all present over there you will see that this axi light interface also has a bunch of wires corresponding to the actual data in and data out that are going to communicate with the fft block okay so ultimately what is going to happen is it will look something like this this is the axi light interface module right which internally has two block rams m1 and m2 okay from the outside world data comes in on the bus okay and can get written in here i can also write it in here okay this corresponds to data in this corresponds to data out okay now i should never normally be writing into data out because i expect that to come out of the fft but the axi light interface by itself allows you to write into data out if you want to right we, we don't want to use that functionality but it's available if you do want to use it on the other side it has a bus interface that basically allows it to talk to the fft actual fft core right so the fft core by itself will actually generate signals for talking to data in as well as data out okay address data and control and that is what we are seeing over here right the blocks essentially correspond to this these first six signals correspond to the real and imaginary signals that are sent out to the fft block or rather that are coming in from the fft block you can see that the address and the ce are inputs 
and the real underscore q0 and image underscore q0 are the outputs of this axi light block right so the fft basically says okay give me this data the axi light block takes the data which is stored in this m1 and m1 ram which is the data in ram and gives it to the fft block similarly after everything is done the data out is accessed okay and in this case what is happening is the fft block is going to generate the addresses generate the chip enable generate the write enable and the data and all that the xl8 block has to do is take that data store it into m2 so that later when the cpu asks for it over the axi bus it can give that data back to the cpu you can see in this module that there are some information some useful information over here it basically says these are the control signals okay so address 0 out of those out of the 10 bit address space address number 000 corresponds to a control signal bit 0 of that is the start ap underscore start signal okay what does that mean it means that if i write something to that signal okay it will cause the module to start okay you will notice that when i look to the interface over here i don't see an ap underscore start signal i don't see an ap underscore done signal ready signal none of those are there they have all gone into the axi bus okay so now if i want to start the module i have to write one to position number to address number zero inside the peripheral how do i check whether the module is done i read that signal and check whether bit number one is set okay interestingly you will also see that it, there is something called a cor over here what is cor it stands for clear on read right that's mentioned at the bottom over here okay so clear on read essentially means that it will make the done signal high but if you go into a polling mode where you are basically looking for that done signal value right it will clear the done signal as soon as you read it so the very first time that you read it and it says that it's done after that it will clear that done signal and go back to the idle state waiting for the next input okay but otherwise if you have not read it it will remain over there it will remain done and wait for you to at least read it before it can go back to the idle state okay similarly there is a another one that says whether it's idle and also another one that says whether it's ready okay there is another bit that is set for auto restart we will ignore this for now there are also a bunch of other registers that are for interrupt processing which again we are not going to use now this these two lines or three lines over here they essentially say how you can write into the data in okay it says that address locations 0x080 up to 0x0ff are mapped to the data in memory block so from the axi bus if i try writing into those locations the data will get stored directly into that memory block okay there are 32 locations of 32 bits each this is the number of addresses they are byte addresses okay therefore there are 128 such addresses they are reserved for that similarly the next set of addresses are for the data in imaginary similarly the data out real and data out imaginary all of those have addresses assigned for them okay so these numbers are actually important to know we'll use that in the c code when we finally want to interface with the peripheral how does this actually behave if you look at it what you will find is that there are a whole bunch of axi light axi ram modules that are instantiated over here okay what is an axi light underscore axi ram it's there right at the bottom of this file okay you will see that effectively what it's doing is an axi light axi ram module essentially consists of clock address ce we the b is basically byte select d0 q0 right so the d is what do you want to write into the ram q0 is what do you want to read out from the ram okay and there are another set clock one address one etc 
but if you look inside it you will find that the local signal is actually just one signal memory it's a two dimensional array okay if you have four bytes then it will be basically four bytes wide and depth words deep okay so in this case it will be four bytes wide 32 bits and 32 elements depth that is the number of values that i want to write into it in your case for the 1000 point 1024 point 50 the depth will be 1024 if you look at it what it basically says is the reading part is always reading from the same memory the writing is also writing to the same memory in other words this is a dual port ram okay that's what enables this entire behavior over here i can write from the axi side read from the fft side or write from the fft side read from the axi side whichever one both are okay in this case of course finally what will happen is if i try writing from both sides what should happen if i try reading from both sides what should happen those kind of things are still question marks how this gets synthesized will determine what actually happens over there right if both sides try to write to it at the same time that is effectively something called contention on the memory right in this case we are not really addressing that at all we are just sort of saying this is a dual port memory how it you know if you try doing something of that sort you will probably get the wrong answer so in other words if you try writing data into it while the fft is processing you are probably going to get junk as the result there are a whole lot of you know signals going on over here which if you look at it you can actually recognize most of them you can understand what they are doing they are literally looking at the addresses that are being sent the subset of addresses looking for whether it's one of those control signals or whether it's something supposed to go into the data and appropriately implementing the logic for that okay so the nice thing about this entire hls approach is that this whole thing was taken care of you uh, care for you automatically that's the biggest simplification if you really look at it it's entirely possible for you to write this code as well it's not very complicated it's a standard template you need to make modifications to it if at all you do need to write very log code for an axi interface it's not too hard it can be done so this is the end result we have this two dual port block rams data in and data out we have the address decoder in the bus somewhere which will take care of sending only a subset of the address bus uh, bits to this peripheral and once the peripheral gets a start signal which again we do by means of one of the control registers it will operate do some work and finally set the done flag which we can then keep on checking to see whether the work is complete okay what do i do with all of this once i have finished the synthesis the normal thing to do would be to go up to this block up there next to the rtl co simulation which says export rtl right and when i try exporting the rtl as ip it will basically give me some options over here the standard the format is something called the ip catalog format right there are a few other options also available over here but the ip catalog is the most useful one it allows you to import it into the vivado system which can then be used for putting an entire block together now i am going to switch over now assuming that you know the ip export has been done i am going to switch over to the vivado system now right because of shortage of time i have already put all these projects together i am just going to show you the end results what we can do is in tomorrow's class what i would suggest is we'll meet in the ie lab rather than waiting for a lecture from our side i would suggest that you try it out if you have your own computers or your own projects that you have tried out and you are having any troubles with them we can help you sort them out the ts will also be talking a little bit about the projects themselves but for the most part the idea is to make sure that all of you get started on actually implementing these things in vivado the video link that i had sent out earlier also covers a large part of how to put together a vivado project that uses the microblaze processor target we are going to be using zinc the arm processor very similar you don't need to worry too much about the differences okay so what does the vivado project look like once you have started the project itself right the main thing is to say that we will be creating a block design and 
Let's look a little bit more closely at what the block design itself entails. Right? So there are these modules over here. One is the zinc processor itself. Right? This large module that you have over here. Fairly standard module. The what I have done to this is these things, the RST underscore PS7 as well as the AXI underscore peripheral module. I did not add them to the system. They got added automatically. What I did add was these two modules. One is the FFT and this other one is a GPIO. Not really required for this design. I just put it in there to show what happens if you have two peripherals sitting in the system. Okay. Plus on the board, you can make LEDs blink if you do this. So it looks nice. Right. So we have two peripherals. Both are connected to the AXI light interface. Right. This thing over here, this AXI interconnect module is something created automatically by the Vivado IP integrator. It basically generates one port out here. Right. This M underscore axi basically means it's an axi master. Each axi master port over here can talk to one slave. In our case, we have two slaves, the GPIO and the FFT. Therefore, there are two axi masters. If you create more peripherals over there, it will automatically readjust and add those things for you. Similarly, on this other end, we have the situation that over here, this side of it is actually looking like an axi slave. Why? Because that has to talk to the CPU. As far as this side, the left hand side of the AXI interconnect is concerned, the bus is the slave. The, ma the CPU is the master. So the CPU talks to the bus, the bus in turn talks to the peripherals. Okay. And it also has like a few other signals that are required for determining each of these signals. What kind of clock and reset signals are they using so that internally it can do whatever resets that it requires. Like I said, you don't need to worry about it. IP integrator takes care of this for you. Okay. So this is what the system block diagram looks like. The zinc processor is nice. It already has a hard IP core for uh, the UART, the serial port, the ethernet, all those kinds of things are already taken care of. So you don't need to worry about them. Right. What is interesting is on the top tab over here, you see something called the address editor. Okay. If I click on that, unfortunately, I don't think I can zoom in on this. It doesn't allow me to zoom in. You will see that there are two or rather three things of interest over here. One is right at the top. It says data 32 bits 0x400 4000,000, right? So if you look at that, essentially what it's saying is that the first one gig of RAM is reserved for physical memory. Okay. In practice, this board actually has only 512 MB of RAM, but it has anyway reserved the first gig and said that you can only use it for physical memory. The S underscore AXI, if I go back and look at the diagram, the S underscore AXI corresponds to my GPIO block. And this other one is S underscore AXI underscore AXI Lite. you remember the name that we saw when we created the FFT module. Those are the two names that I'm going to find over here. So the S underscore Axi corresponds to the GPIO block. Axi light corresponds to the FFT block. The starting address of this uh, GPIO block is 41200000. In other words, outside the range of the physical memory, but still within a 32 bit address range. Okay. Why is it outside the range of the physical memory? We don't want any confusion. The processor should be very clear that this is not part of the physical memory. It is something else. Okay. That just makes it easier for the programmer when you're finally doing it. You don't want to put physical memory and a peripheral in the same overlapping address space. What will happen if you do that? It's not going to make the system crash and burn, but the bus will be able to talk to only one of them. Okay. So 4120000 corresponds to the starting address of the GPIO. The ending address is FFFF. The address range is 64K, right? Now this GPIO actually corresponds to eight pins. Even if I gave a separate address for each pin, I need only eight addresses. I'm giving 64,000, right? 
The point is I don't care, right? I have those addresses, I can't do anything else with them. So just assign an address space and then decide what to do with it later. Same story for the FFT block as well. I've assigned a 64K address space to it. The FFT at least uses a little more because I've actually assigned some of those addresses for writing to data in, reading from data out, etc. So it needs at least around a thousand or so addresses. But I'm assigning 64,000. Who cares? We have all the memory that we need anyway. Okay. So these numbers are important because those are the base addresses that we will use in order to talk to it from our program. Now, if you have gone through the video of the basic uh, microblaze based hello world system, what we do after this is basically first of all generate a bit stream which was used for programming the FPGA. Right? That was not covered in that video because that was only concentrating on simulation. But in this case, I would need to generate a bit stream and program the FPGA. But in addition to that, I would also need to export this hardware and then start an SDK project, a software development kit project. This is what the project that I have created looks like. Okay, So I essentially went through this process where I said, create a new application project. OS platform, I chose Linux, gave it some name, chose C++ over here and proceed. Okay. It creates a dummy file for you, which I have then populated with a copy of some other code that I had from some other place. Okay. The first part of it, let's take a look at the main function. Okay. Hopefully you recognize this as pretty much the same as your test bench, right? I have two IF streams reading from data in and data uh, expected output. I read in the value over here. I call the FFT function and then I compare it against the result. This is exactly what we did in the regular test bench. There are a few lines of code that are added over here, right? Which basically correspond to the actual hardware portion, right? All these time spec underscore get commands, just ignore them completely for now. They are used for finding out how much time is spent in each function, right? So you can safely just omit them from your consideration for the time being. What is important is how do I get the hardware to work? It essentially corresponds to four steps. First, I write data into the FFT. Okay. I'll show you what this function looks like. I have another function to start the core. A third function that checks whether the core is done, it has completed operation and a fourth function to read back the data from the FFT. Okay. What do those functions themselves look like? The first thing that I have to do is I call a function called setup the device memory, right? This is making use of a property of the Linux operating system, which allows you to directly access raw memory in the system. Okay, I set it up such that it basically returns, you know, finds a pointer that allows me to access the exact location 43C0, this FFT base. Okay, I have given this address, which is the address I found in Vivado IP integrator, the address editor there, right? And once I say set up devmem with this IP address, it will return a pointer to me, which I can then use to directly talk to the periphery. Okay. Once I have got that, I can do a few things. This pointer that I have got is just an unsigned integer. It's a 32 bit value. If I want to read something from it, I have to cast it as an integer, as an int star. Okay. What does that mean? So this is the part where hopefully all of you are able to you know, recall what you know about C pointers. If not, then you need to spend some time understanding this. Not too much because for the most part, these are standard templates that you can use. But if you want to modify it for anything, you will definitely need to be using these pointers and all a lot more. Ultimately, all that this means is in C, if I look at something as a, if I do this casting, right, I put those brackets and int star before it, I'm basically saying, take the value PTR plus offset and think of it as a pointer to an integer. Okay. And if you think of it as a pointer to integer and then take star of that, you will get whatever was stored at that pointer to integer. 
which in this case is as good as reading back from that memory location. Therefore, if I say check status with an offset of zero, it's going to return the status flags to me. I have another similar function which specifically checks the done signal. It does exactly the same thing. It reads back int star ptr, but then checks whether that bit number two was set or not. Okay. In order to start the core, what should I do? I write one to the status register, to the control register. Do it the same way. Think of that PTR as an int star, write something into it. How do I write to the FFT? You remember there was a range of addresses 0x80 to 0xff, which was assigned for the data in real. Okay. So I take my float star input. I tell the compiler to think of it as an int star and write. Okay. So this kind of stuff is some, you know, if you think about it, it is like unnecessarily complicated. On the other hand, it is something that you have to live with because you want to make your programs talk to the system. The best thing to do is write out one function that completely encapsulates all this messy pointer manipulation that you need to do so that when I call a function that says write to FFT, it's a lot, a lot more clear. It's very easy to understand what I'm trying to do. Okay. So if I go back to my main code, this is what we are saying. Essentially, I have a write to FFT, start the core, check whether it's done, read back the data. After that, I print out some values and I also print the status signal and so on. I once again check whether the result that it computes is correct. Okay. If either the software or the hardware failed, I'll print that out. And finally, I will return from the function. Okay. So I have gone ahead, compiled this entire thing, run it, right? What I have over here is, this is an actual zinc, the Z board that's connected to the computer in my office. Okay. Tomorrow we'll show you some of these things in the lab. We'll allow you to basically play around with them. In general, we don't have enough Z boards that we can give one to each of you for an extended duration to run, right? But what we can do is set it up such that once you have compiled all your code and are ready to run it, there will be one remote mechanism where you can just upload your file. It will run and give you back the results. That is being set up. We'll have it set up quite soon so that you can start experimenting with it. Okay. I already have the data in CPP, data out, etc. stored over here. So if I actually run this, what you will find is that it should give me the results of the uh, testing, right? This is the ELF file that got created when I actually compiled this program. So an ELF file is just something called the extensible linker format. It finally means an executable file. Okay. So in this case, once you compile this or build this program, it creates an ELF file. I have copied that over onto the Z board. How have I done it? The interesting thing is I've actually done it using SSH. So that board has an IP address. It has full ethernet communication. Therefore I was actually able to just use SCP and copy the file over onto that. Okay. But once I have done that and I try running the program, this is what I see as the final result. Okay. So let's quickly go through and understand what it's saying. The very first line over here says software time. Okay. How did I get that number? I called this time spec get function before and after the FFT function call. And I have a function called TS delta that basically computes the difference between them. Okay. Time spec is a C function that is essentially supposed to return the number of nanoseconds elapsed since the beginning of the system booting up or something like that. So if I take two time specs and subtract them, it will tell me how many nanoseconds elapsed between the two calls to time spec get. Okay. What this tells me is that the call to the FFT function, right? The complete software took 58.5 microseconds. How accurate is this? I would definitely not worry about the nanoseconds part, but at the microsecond scale, it is definitely quite accurate, right? It does not change too much with time. 
after that what i'm actually printing out is these two lines are actually unnecessary right it's just a sort of repetition all that i'm doing is checking the status of the system and each time it says status 4 what does that mean if you go back and look at this code out here it essentially says that bit 2 which is 100 so that's bit 2 corresponds to apid okay so effectively all that this status of 0x4 means is that the module is idle ready to take data okay you can also sort of put it in different modes where each time you read it out you print out the value you'll find that after it has done computation it changes to 6 which basically says that the done signal has gone high okay I write to the FFT, I also compute the time after writing to FFT, I start the core and wait until it's done, I, I am polling, okay, so I am basically sort of putting it in a spinning loop over there where it keeps on checking that status, it turns out that it actually runs 9 times through that loop before the FFT returns a done signal, okay, then I print out the time values, the total time taken was 40 microseconds good so i do have a speed up at least on paper right the software took 58 microseconds my hardware is taking 40 microseconds the interesting thing comes after that how long did the actual computation take three microseconds okay does this make sense let's look at the numbers what i have over here is an estimate of 300 clock cycles at a clock period of 10 nanoseconds okay that's 3 microseconds matches fairly closely with what I'm seeing over here because what I'm seeing this 3500 is the time taken for the FFT plus some overhead corresponding to the polling okay so this matches fairly well with what we expect the time required to write data is 20 microseconds just 32 words were being written in 32 plus 32 so 32 real 32 imaginary 64 words were being written in that took 20 microseconds 64 words were being read out that took 14 microseconds okay so what you can see from this is yes you did get a speed up but you could have got at more than 10x speed up not a 1.3x speed up right because most of the time got spent in sending the data in and out of the system okay so this is sort of you know it has sort of put all the parts together essentially what we had was we started off with a module that we created the fft we know that it is expected to give some speed up because it finishes within 300 clock cycles we made it an axialite interface connected it to the bus and to the cpu wrote some functions that allow the CPU to transfer data into and out of the system and start it and once you measure the time you basically see that this is what you are observing the actual computation time matches quite closely with what we expect but the writing and reading time completely dominate that what can we do about it there are a few things you can do in particular like I said the Axie Lite interface is not a good way for writing large amounts of data there are better ways of doing it okay the other thing is you might actually have to see can I reduce the amount of data that I write and do more computation for a given amount of writing. Okay, Those are all things that you will have to keep in mind as you go forward in the project. This is actually an interesting insight which applies across the board to most computations that happen on almost any kind of system today. Right? We are currently in a stage where the majority of systems are memory bound and not compute bound. Okay, if you look at most of the architectures that people are looking at nowadays for neural networks or any other things, most of the optimizations there are how do I get efficient memory transfers and this is why. Okay, alright, we'll stop here for now. Like I said, tomorrow's class will be in the IE lab. Uh, what I would like from all of you is that you already try out your parts of uh, and try to get some of these things working on your own systems, right, at least do the compilation and so on. We can help you to get it running on hardware, at least to try things out if possible on hardware. The hardware itself will be made available in a restricted fashion to different people at different times. You will need to sort of do some time sharing. But the ability to just run code like this and try it out, 
we are trying to make it in a time shared basis where you can just basically upload your code and pretty much see the results immediately okay as long as it's just something that will get printed out in this way okay all right